Good morning and welcome everybody to MGM Talks. Um, as usual in the beginning, please note uh, that this event will be recorded and published on our social media channels as well as on our homepage. Yeah, meanwhile, um, new members joined us and I would like to introduce them with pleasure. So Dr. Andrea Köppel and Diplom Engineer Wolfgang Köppel, business, business partnership focusing on management and consulting as well as real estate projects based in Pertelsdorf in Lower Austria, owned by former country lead of 3M Austria, Dr. Andrea Köppel and husband. The company is still in development currently focusing on real estate while building up coaching and consulting segments. So please welcome Dr. Andrea Köppel to that you joined us. The second uh, company was Kündril Austria, yeah. a trusted partner for leading companies in Austria, design, implement, operate and modernize business critical IT systems. Their goal is to deliver modern, efficient and reliable IT services for a strong local and global presence and in close cooperation with our partners. 400 global data centers, two of which in Austria, in 63 countries and access to some of the greatest talents in the industry. So please welcome Magister Maria Kirschner as a new member. We're happy that you joined us. Uh, the last new member since uh, the beginning of the year is mostly AI, founded in 2017 in Vienna by Michael Platzer, Claudius Kalcher and Roland Kubela, three distinguished data scientists, pioneered the creation of structured synthetic data for AI model development and software testing. Currently works with multiple Fortune 100 banks and insurers in Europe and in North America. So please welcome Tobias Han. Tobias Han? Yes. Hello. Okay. Great well, to you, be a member. Warm welcome to the MGM. Thank you. We're happy that you joined us. So before we come to our speaker, Professor Dr. Wagner, I just want to highlight our next events in March. Many of them and interesting ones. On March 10th, we have an MGM lecture by Vlaovic Group. On March 17th, our ambassador welcome gala dinner in honor of Her Excellency Victoria Reggie Kennedy. On March 24th, Amcham lecture by BDO. And on March 25th, our Amcham talks in person at the Hilton Plaza again uh, with Magister Oliver Schmerholz, General Director of ÖAMTC. So now it's time for our today's topic. And the topic is how will the COVID-19 pandemic end? And I warmly welcome Professor Dr. Michael Wagner. And um, I take the liberty to introduce you briefly. You're Vice Director of the Center of Microbiology and Environmental System Science at the University of Vienna. Visiting Professor in Engineering Science at the University of Oxford. Distinguished Professor at Aalborg University in Denmark, head of the large instrument facility of Advanced Isotope Research, University of Vienna, and co-developer of the Goggle test and ranked as 11th by the Institute for Scientific Information as one of the most quoted microbiologists in the world. So, Professor Wagner, I would like uh, to hand over to you the stage is yours, and um, afterwards we will have a Q and A session. Please. Yeah. Good morning. Um, just need to good good reminder here. Need to turn off my <laughs> cell phone. Right. So, um, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for the uh, kind invitation. It's a pleasure and honor to be here this morning and to be able to share with you some ideas, thoughts about um, how the pandemic will end or or continue. And uh, for that purpose, I have assembled a few slides, which I will share with you now. And so, one second. Just 
in the corner. And now I should be ready to show you my slides. Can you see them? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. So I selected this topic because I thought it might be of interest to all of us. Um, I realized when I assembled the slides yesterday that it's quite a challenging topic, the crystal ball look, but I would like to take you on a quick journey and yeah, dare to look into the crystal ball, what might happen in the next months or years with the pandemic. But before I do this, I briefly introduce you my team, just a few slides, two or three slides, what we do in non-pandemic times and also in pandemic times, in addition to the work uh, with COVID-19. So this is a newly founded faculty at the University of Vienna. We are really proud that we became uh, the 20th faculty. It doesn't happen every, every year in, we have in, in this um, large university that a new faculty is founded. 200 microbiologists from almost 30 different countries in the world. And we are interested in the planet of microbes. So in, usually in bacteria, not in viruses, but we also work a little bit with viruses. And they, these bacteria, they are um, essential for the health of our planet. So there would be no, no living on our planet without microbes. They play key roles for uh, remediation, for global change, for um, global warming. They are essential also in the human body. We consist of many, many microbes, and without them, we could not make a, a living. They influence not only digestion in the gut, they influence our mood, they influence hundreds of diseases, they influence how well pharmaceuticals work in us. So um, this is really a hot topic, microbiome research, and we are, I think, one of the leading centers in the world analyzing the function of those microbes. But when the pandemic started, in 2019, uh, we uh, immediately came together with a group of um, microbiologists and other molecular biologists and said, we want to help. You might still remember that this was a time when um, even the testing capacity was, uh, was very limited. So in Austria, we had almost no capacity to test for SARS-CoV-2. Um, even the swaps for the nasopharyngeal sample and uh, sampling were, were under limited supply in the beginning, in, in winter 2020. So we repurposed equipment we had in our labs and we repurposed it and built a pipeline um, to do PCR testing. And I don't go through all the details. I just want to share with you sort of what we did in the pandemic before I will look in the crystal ball. I repurposed the equipment just to build a high throughput pipeline for PCR testing. And we said, let's find a smarter way to take samples instead of swaps because they are pay painful. You hardly can do it with kids. No one can do it alone at home. So we said, let's try gargling as a um, as a way to get access to samples, which everyone can uh, do at home. So this pipeline was then developed in March 2020, and uh, we tested it then, and I had the pleasure to lead this project in a pilot school study in 11 Viennese schools in June 2020, so a long time ago. We also did for the first time pooling there, so samples, gargle samples from more than uh, one pupil were pooled and analyzed together. And so this pipeline of gargling, pooling, PCR uh, was established in June 2020. It was very successful and a lot of attention was created by, by this new way of um, analyzing or uh, detecting SARS-CoV-2 internationally. So we had two articles in the Wall Street Journal. We made it to the cover um, of the Spiegel. And so internationally, there was a lot of attention and as you know, in Vienna, now this um, testing pipeline, this approach, gargling, pooling, um, PCR testing has become uh, the screening tool freely available to everyone in the city. And um, I then moved on and uh, headed a large study on SARS-CoV-2 in 250 Austrian schools over the school year 2020-2021. Uh, with 10,000 pupils involved, 1,200 teachers, which were sampled 
bio gargling pooling PCR six times in the school year. And this really changed our view also internationally how children contribute uh, to this pandemic because we showed that pupils younger than 10 years had a similar uh, prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 than older pupils or teachers and that in schools, and this is data from the second and third wave, uh, in schools, SARS-CoV-2 was as prevalent as in the society. At that time, you might no longer remember, but at that time, there was still the dogma that children hardly contribute to the spread of the virus. And we showed that this is unfortunately not the case. And today has also to do with the vaccination status and many other factors. Uh, children are a main factor in the spread of the virus. We also showed that the antigen tests, which you do in the front part of your nose, detect only about 20% of the infected pupils. And we developed for, uh, for the government a concept for protecting the schools so that you can keep them open during the pandemic. Um, unfortunately, this concept was only partly realized. Um, and I'm still convinced if it has, would have been fully realized, we would have had no problems in, in schools with SARS-CoV-2. So what I will, so this, the last two or three slides gave you um, maybe a, a taste of what I have been contributing to the fight against the pandemic together with the larger team, obviously. And I would like now to use the remaining time to look into the crystal ball and to say what will happen in 2022 and beyond and um, discuss with you the factors uh, which make it very difficult to make a precise prediction and give you a, a feeling for which factors are essential, how this pandemic uh, will continue. So obviously the key point to pay attention to is disease severity. So will, it, will COVID-19 become the sniffles, like Trump said very early on, or um, will it become a very severe, will it remain a very severe disease? Um, and which factors do affect this? So it's virus evolution. I will quickly talk about that. I will first talk about immunity and therapeutic drugs obviously can help us even if it's a severe disease, if we can treat it, it is not as scary as if we have no treatment available. So I will start a little bit uh, with immunity and um, immunity is a main factor which has caused the decrease of the so-called infection fatality ratio. These are data from the UK, but it's basically a, a global pattern. So this tells you the infection fatality ratio, how, what's the percentage of people who get infected, can also be asymptomatic, what is the percentage of infected people that die from COVID-19? And it was quite high in the beginning, decreased over time, increased again in January 2021 in England to more than 1% of the infected people died. And since then decreased continuously and now is around 0.1% with Omicron, which is just as a side point, still twice, about twice the um, lethality of the seasonal influenza. People compared it to influenza even here, but there is a huge difference to seasonal influenza if it comes to the infection fatality ratio. So which factors caused this pattern? First of all, the dark figure. In the beginning, uh, we had almost no PCR testing and so on. So many infections were overlooked and only the severe ones which showed up at hospital were detected. And obviously then the infection fatality ratio is high because you see only those who really suffer from the disease and not the asymptomatic ones. This explains this decrease here. Then the age distribution, if more the elderly are, are infected, and at different periods during the pandemic, different parts of the population were affected most. So age distribution has an influence on this pattern of the infections, age distribution. Immunity. Over time, people got more and more immunity, either by vaccination or because they were already infected, and that protects to a certain level against death. Then the virus variants, which variants are circulating? The alpha variant was, for example, more severe than the Wuhan virus. Also the delta was more severe 
than offer. But here we had already vaccination and immunity from previous infections. And treatment, we became much better in treating in the hospital um, this disease and so less people die from it. So the main protective tool we have is obviously vaccination. And I just want to illustrate this once again to you. I know, I'm sure you all know this, but it's really quite an impressive uh, success story. So these are the COVID-19 deaths by vaccination status in the US, all ages over 18 years old. So this is the, the incidence of deaths per 100,000 over time. So quite a considerable number of people die. And these are recent data, right? So still die despite Omicron. But among those which are fully vaccinated two times without the booster dose, you have an 85% reduction in death. If you are vaccinated with the booster dose, it even increases to 96% reduction of death. And these are, I think, really impressive data. But this does not mean that even in well-vaccinated countries like Denmark with high infection numbers, that no one dies anymore from COVID-19. So these are the deaths by death certificate. So you see the different waves. So these are the, how many people die. And currently quite some people die in, in Denmark with a positive COVID-19 um, test. Often people argue, yeah, they die not from COVID, they die with COVID because you have so many infections currently. But if you look at the death certificates, the, the dark red ones are those which definitely died with, uh, uh, from COVID, not with COVID. So there's, the number is still quite higher than before Omicron. So there is, because of the huge number of infections, there is also an increase in deaths again due to Omicron. The orange ones are where the death certificates have not been analyzed uh, or received yet. And those are the ones which die with COVID, but not necessarily from COVID, the bright yellow ones. But again, doctors tell me, this is not easy to distinguish. If you die from a thrombosis um, on your death certificate, there will be thrombosis written, but you have an increased thrombosis risk from COVID. So there is a big gray zone, right? How do you decide whether a heart attack which is also increased, you have an increased risk if you're infected, came from COVID or not. So we don't know whether how many of those died at the end from COVID um, or with COVID, but just wanted to share this recent data with you. This is a complicated figure, but still I think important. This is not death, this is hospital, hospital admission. And it shows you for Delta in orange and for Omicron in blue, the hazard ratio. That means if you would not be vaccinated, you, ha you have this hazard ratio of one. So certain ratio of people who go to a hospital. And you can say, see if you're vaccinated, this hazard ratio decreases. But it decreases less, a little bit less for Omicron than for Delta. These are variant specific hazard ratios. So if you have an Omicron infection, the overall risk to go to hospital is much lower than for Delta, but the vaccination does give you additional protection for hospitalization, but not as much as it gave you for Delta. And we will see in a minute why this is the case, but there is a, a strong reduction in hospitalization risk too, due to the vaccinations, especially if you're boosted. In blue are the boosted cases. So you have a low hazard ratio. This is two times vaccinated. In red is one time vaccinated. This looks complicated, but it's simple. Um, I will uh, go through this slide with you in a, in a second. This slide deals with the question, why do we see so many reinfections? People even question the value of the vaccination and, and say, hey, we have so many breakthrough infections, there is something not working. I just showed you, you go back, that it's working very well, right? If you look at the reduction of death or the reduction of risk to get hospitalized, so vaccinations really work very well, but we see many breakthrough infections. Should we be surprised about this? No, we shouldn't. So these are data on other coronaviruses. These are common cold coronaviruses. 
there are four common cold coronaviruses circulating in the population since centuries. And these are antibody levels in individuals against these common cold coronaviruses. And what you see is it's going down and up and down and up and down and up in, individual, in individuals over the years. So and any, every time when you go up, you had an infection because you boost so, sort of your immunity with a, another infection of this common cold coronavirus. So for the coronaviruses, the respiratory coronaviruses, it's totally normal that you get reinfected even if you have an immunity and this boosts your immunity to new levels and then you have waning immunity, you can get reinfected, waning immunity, and it continues like that. This looks complicated, but it's again, very simple. It's the time between infections in many, I think 10 individuals with common cold coronaviruses. Just let's look at the total, this is the total of these four coronaviruses. So usually you have, this is the mean, the black bar here. So you, every 30 months, so every two to three years, you get reinfected with the common cold coronavirus. So you have immunity, it's waning, you get reinfected, it's waning, you get reinfected, but you rarely get really severely sick. And this is how our immune system works with respiratory diseases. It's like a fortress with uh, several defense layers, right? So you have epithelial biology on the surface of your um, mucus layers, you have innate immunity, I don't go into details, you have antibodies, you have the T cell mediated immunity, so you have several defense layers. And it's quite normal and it's, in our, it's our, actually in our host's mind that uh, protection from infection does not last as long as protection from severe disease. So we do allow our immune system, the virus to enter, but not to come to our home, right, <laughs> to, to really kill us because this keeps the troops battle-hardened, basically. So you reboost your immunity, it adapts to new variants if they are closely related. You get sort of an immune system update by breakthrough infections. So we should not be, in general, concerned to be concerned too much about breakthrough infections as long as they cause mild disease. This was a quick journey through immunity, but it's intimately linked with virus evolution because at the end, it's a game between or competition between immunity and virus evolution. This is a phylogenetic tree, so like a family tree of um, SARS-CoV-2. And you know some of the names here, um, but it's a, it has a very strange shape. So for example, these are all, these are genome sequences. You can really calculate these trees. This, these are the Delta, this was the, these are Delta variants. And usually all viruses evolve. So Omicron accumulates about two mutations per month, but you see this slow evolution. So it builds then like a network here of closely collected strains. But then everyone would have expected that after Delta, you will see sort of an offspring from this Delta canopy, a new lineage coming off here, and this will be the new variant. But what happened, we ran into Omicron, which is taught at the totally different place in the SARS-CoV-2 tree. And this was actually a big surprise. So this Omicron, the whole world was dominated by Delta. And then all of a sudden, a totally new virus variant emerged which was not descending from Delta, but came sort of out of the blue. I can illustrate this by this tree here. This is more a schematic representation. So here you have the tree, you have Delta, and everyone would have thought that in this canopy of Delta, the new Omicron will evolve, but it just spread out of this uh, totally somewhere else in the, in the tree with different properties. And this was a big surprise to everyone dealing with virus evolution. And if you look at the Omicron, this looks complicated, but it's pretty straightforward. This is the receptor binding site of the spike protein. So this is this, this needle with which the virus binds to your cell. And the blue dots here are mutations, so are changes in and, and the red ones too. And you see, this is Delta, has a few changes, 
in this crucial part of the virus, while Omicron has many, many changes here. So it's, it has totally changed its binding properties to our, cell, to our cells. And this has dramatic influences on the infectivity, on immune escape, so how well can it escape our immune system, and also indirectly on disease severity. We know that Omicron causes milder disease, right? So there are the, there's the question, how can it happen that such a, a Omicron variant with so many changes all of a sudden pops up? And there are three hypotheses how this can happen. And I would like to uh, discuss those three briefly with you. Hypothesis one is silent spread. So this Omicron evolved slowly, like we know it for SARS-CoV-2, somewhere in the world, but we didn't notice it because it was a region of the world, could also be Austria, <laughs> with insufficient monitoring. And we didn't see it coming because there was no genome sequencing somewhere, I don't know, in Africa or wherever, Asia, in a region where we have no good monitoring. And all of a sudden, it spread all over the world. Experts think this is not a very likely scenario because it's, um, it's not very likely. It could be an animal uh, because there's so much traveling on, the, on our planet. So people think it's, this is an unlikely scenario. Or animal hosts. This is much more likely. If we zoom in here, um, you know that, uh, that SARS-CoV-2 came from bats, maybe via another an animal. The pangolin was under discussion, infected us, caused uh, diseases. And we infected, it's something which is called rever reverse zoonosis. Humans then infected again animals all kinds of animals. In the beginning, rats, for example, could not be infected with SARS-CoV-2, but the new variants can even infect mice and rats. And then from those animals, the virus adapts to the animals and can jump back to, um, to humans. And that's one idea how Omicron might have evolved. And that all the changes we see in Omicron were a product from adaptation to new animal hosts. And the third theory is chronic infection. So in immunocompromised persons, HIV patients, for example, they cannot clear such a SARS-CoV-2 infection. They cannot get rid of it. They have it for many, many months. And this gives the virus a playground to evolve properties to protect themselves against immunity and to, and to develop immune escape. So and either, either an animal host or chronic infection is probably the source of these new virus variant. It, it makes it so difficult to predict the properties of the next variants because totally new variants all of a sudden can emerge from animals or from chronic infection. A few more slides I would like to share with you if you look in the future. So it's hard to predict the properties of the next, um, of the next variant. But basically, it's only a matter of time, right? You develop immunity, immunity wanes. And then depending on the immune escape properties of the variant, Omicron is very good in immune escape, Delta is a bit less immune escape, Alpha had even less immune escape. If, if the immune escape is strong enough, it outcompetes immunity and infections occur. This is South Africa data. And you see these infection waves, Wuhan, Beta, alpha a little bit, delta, and then Omicron. So it takes time until immunity wanes from infection or from vaccination, and then you get the next wave. And this is certainly what will happen here too. There is often we discuss seasonal effects. The common cold coronaviruses are strongly seasonal. These are US data. So in spring and in winter, you have high numbers of infections. In summer, you have very low numbers of infections. This pattern is a bit more blurry for SARS-CoV-2. This is Austria, infection numbers. The blue boxes are summer, 20, summer 2020, summer 21. Yes, there is a decrease, but you also see increasing numbers here in summer. So I would not bet on that we would not have a wave in summer. The, uh, this, the seasonal pattern is not fully developed. See, summer slows down the virus spread, but it might not be strong enough. Depends on the properties of the next variant. 
the, I think almost last slide I wanted to share with you. So we talked about immunity. We talked about um, virus evolution. And I would like to talk about treatment. Luckily, due to research, we have now some specific treatment options for SARS-CoV-2. These can be monoclonal antibodies, and these can be antivirals, like Paxlovid, I'm sure you have heard about it, or Remdesivir or Molnupiravir. This is a great achievement uh, by, by science, and they, they reduce the risk of severe disease sometimes by 80%. But we see already there is also evolution going on, right? Omicron already is resistant against many of the monoclonal antibodies. And if we now roll out Paxlovid and Remdesivir and so on, the virus will get resistant against it. It's almost guaranteed. So we know from other viruses, you need to combine therapies to keep resistance levels low. So in the future, if you get a, a SARS-CoV-2 infection, there will be treatments available, but probably you will need to take more than one pill to avoid the buildup of resistance. I'm concerned that we use those two, um, two wide, as a very, very, in a wide, very widespread manner without thinking too much about it. And we will, the virus will evolve resistance before we have a sufficient number of antivirals to have well-functional combinatorial therapies. So there is also this game, like with your immune system, right? Between virus evolution and our immunity or uh, treatment. So the virus will evolve resistant and we will develop new antivirals and it's a, it's a race. And one other point, which is really important and in the current discussion often overlooked, these therapeutic drugs, they only work if you give them very early during disease, the first few days. So you need as a vulnerable person who needs this treatment, you need to get know about your infection very early on. And for this purpose, we need a cost-free, easy, accessible, and sensitive testing system like we have in Vienna. If we shut this down also from the, for the vulnerable persons, they will not know about their infection early enough to get efficient treatment. So we have to find a way to make testing accessible for the vulnerables also at low, when the infection numbers go down. So my conclusions. Omicron was serendipity. We were really lucky. There is no selection for SARS-CoV-2 variants causing a mild disease. The virus does not benefit. It's, it's an urban myth. Everyone says virus evolves becoming more mild to, be, to cause more mild disease. This is not the case for coronaviruses because people die so late in the disease that it doesn't matter for the virus whether you die or not. It was just serendipity that it's so mild. The, the next variant may cause more severe disease. And you see this, Delta was more severe than Alpha and Alpha was more severe than Wuhan. So there is no evolution to milder disease. We, had, we were just lucky, but we are no longer immunological naive. So while breakthrough infections will be common, a certain level of protection, mostly from T cells will remain, but there are considerable risks for the vulnerable still. So with immune escape and so on. So we have to keep them uh, protected. And what about long COVID and all the other long-term consequences also of mild infections? Um, we can discuss this if you want afterwards. So immunity pro um, vaccination protects also against these long-term consequences to a certain level, but can we really afford that we all get infected many, 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 many times throughout our lifetime or does this increased the risk of those long-term consequences. We don't know yet. Three scenarios for the end of my talk. Best case scenario, the new, newly emerging variants will be similar to Omicron, will no longer burden the uh, ICUs. Waves will still occur when immunity has waned, as I showed you, but they will have a similar impact as observed for the seasonal influenza. And um, so we will have no we can live with the virus. The most probable scenario is we will have new waves within the next year with a new variant that shows considerable immune escape, also against the Omicron immunity. 
and cause more burden on the ICUs than Omicron because we were just lucky with Omicron. And then the situation will be similar to Delta, so to last fall in, in the next year. And the worst case scenario, a highly infectious and highly vari virulent various in, in, a variant evolves. This is totally possible. It's not the most likely scenario, but totally possible with a complete immune escape. And then we will need basically to start all over again with lockdowns or triage and development of adapted vaccination uh, shots. And therefore, what can I conclude? Transition, this is, this is my last slide. Transitioning from the pandemic situation to a new normal takes time. The intermediate steps are impossible to predict because the virus I showed you, it's in all these animals. We have the immunocompromised person. So it's impossible to predict the next steps in virus evolution. And the new normal is worse than the pre-COVID-19 situation. So we will have, in any case, have a new, at least influenza type of disease, which will stay with us. So we will need to continue to invest in vaccinations and therapeutic drugs, but we need better drugs, more drugs, because the virus develops resistance and easily accessible broad scale testing, PCR testing for the vulnerable. And the communication, that's what I tried to do with you too, to experts and the public should be honest and not unrealistically optimistic. So we will be able to get through this pandemic, but it will be a marathon and not a, 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 a fast thing. So this is my conclusion and I'm happy to take, um, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Yes, I think Dr. Ludwig, you had a question to start. Q&A, please feel free. Yeah, I, I have a question it, it, it just as an interest. From a scientific point of view, what are, is the evidence that this is actually a man-made virus out of Wuhan? It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, hot, a hotly debated, right, I topic. Um, it's, I would say, rather unlikely. We have seen spread from... Uh, you know, let's start like this, bats, these horseshoe bats, horseshoe nose bats, they harbor, uh, people estimate about 5,000 different uh, coronaviruses. And many of them, one can show in the lab, can infect human cells. And we have seen coronaviruses transitioning from animals to humans before. MERS, this disease which came from drom dromedars, SARS, some years ago, SARS-1, right? Which uh, just those diseases, luckily, they were so, they were causing very severe disease, but they didn't spread easily. So about every 10 years now, during the last decades, a coronavirus jumps from an animal to human. And this has to do because humans, you know, go closer to, to animals than in the past. They enter all areas on, on this planet or all regions. And so it, it has been observed before. There is no, if you look at the genome sequence, there's nothing obvious, which looks like having been manipulated. What you cannot exclude, there is a virus research institute in Wuhan, right? And they work with coronaviruses and they do isolate coronaviruses from bats in order to study them. And how can you prove whether, you know, an infection from a coronavirus from a bat occurred in this uh, in this institute and then spread in Wuhan but then it's still coming from a bed it is not something created de novo by humans it might have been sort of a lab accident but it doesn't really matter because it's at the end it's a it was never on purpose and at the end it's a bad virus um, it, whether it came directly from the beds or through a lab I have not the info and no one has it, I think, to, to disprove uh, or prove one of, of, of those transitions. Yeah, Herr Gangel. Hello, Michael. Um, Hi. Very interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent. Um, I was, uh, when, you, when you talked about the virus evolution, 
Uh, I heard once that also the vaccination might have an impact on the different uh, evolutions of the viruses. Is this a myth or is there something behind that? No, like immunity, it's true. Um, it's sort of a, a constant competition. We develop immunity either by infection um, or by vaccination. It's basically we develop antibodies, T cells against this virus. And then the, those virus variants which can escape this immunity, right? Which have just changed like Omicron change on the surface, their, their structure and the antibodies that do no longer detect it, they have a selection advantage. If, you're, if, if there is no immunity, they would not have this, this selection advantage, but then they have a selection advantage and those variants which can escape the immunity will have more hosts because they can infect everyone while the other variants can only infect those who have not been vaccinated and those who are naive immunologically. But the problem is also several anti-vaxxers use this argument, but here there is a, a non-logic in this thinking because you also develop immunity when you get infected and then you cause the same selection pressure, right, on the virus. You also have an immunity and the virus will try to escape this immunity. And this will continue like this. We will, we will see um, new virus variants, which will get better and better in escaping our immunity. And we will get breakthrough infections, the immune system adapts again. And so this is how with the common cold uh, coronaviruses, this is nothing to be too scared about, because you get the breakthrough infection before you get really severe disease and your immune system adapts again to it. That's where we wanted to get to. The problem are those jumps in evolution, which I tried to illustrate in this tree when all of a sudden a totally new virus variant comes, which would not only make a mild breakthrough infection, but cause severe disease again in breakthrough infections because it has so dramatically changed properties because maybe it evolved in an animal for a long time, then um, we will run into problems. This is the, the risk. The, the situation is not yet stable, right? The virus is still very fast evolving. It has not researchers talk about a spa an evolutionary space. It has not endless opportunities to evolve, right? It must still function, the virus. But you have a space to explore as a virus where you can sort of test all the different possibilities. And th this, this exploration goes faster the more virus we have on this planet. And so now with this Omicron wave all over the planet, we will see a very fast evolution of the virus. And no one can predict how much space the virus still has to evolve totally new properties. And after a while, this will calm down because the evolutionary space has been fully tested by the virus. And then we will more and more be the winners with our immunity. But in this transition period, there can still be great surprises, bad surprises also by the virus. And then we might have to adapt the, vaccine, the vaccines. We, so it, it can go very bad, or if the evolutionary space is al almost tested already, it can remain like it is now. Herr Lena, bitte. Yes, good morning. Hello. Thanks a lot. Uh, Michael, thanks a lot for the explanations. I like it a lot. I've got a question uh, with regards to the vaccinations. What I understood basically is that the vaccines we have right now are very much focused on the specifics of a variant. That's why, at least in my understanding, the current vaccines we have uh, do not work as well on Omicron as on the other variants. <laughs> So looking forward, will there be a possibility from a scientific or, or medis, medical uh, perspective uh, to create vaccines that have a more general key to uh, work against uh, basically the, the base of the uh, coronavirus and not uh, with a specific variant only? So will there be like a, a general key for a, for a house? basically. Yeah, that's a, an ex thank you. That's an excellent question. So 
the current vaccines we use, uh, I'm still, and I think all the experts, we are still surprised that they work so well, actually. I think this is a big positive surprise. It, it, people have tried to, to develop vaccines against coronavirus, common cold coronaviruses, and it was never as successful. So, but these are Wuhan-based vaccines, right? To the original variant. And that's why we see breakthrough infections. I showed you that Omicron has changed already a lot, has many mutations. And we, so we see this, you know, they, they get into our fortress, but only through the first defense wing. So we get infected now, but we can, most of us, if we have a good immune system, we will not develop severe disease or die. So they still work. It's surprising that the Wuhan vaccine still work against these dramatically changed variants, but there will pro probably likely there will be a variant at one point where they won't might no longer work as effective and where we need to maybe then develop a new vaccine. But yes, this has been done now, variant specific, but there are efforts to develop pan coronavirus vaccines and in animal models, um, the US Army actually developed some of those vaccines in um, in animal models, they seem to work quite nicely. But honestly, I'm not a vaccinologist, but um, in but what I read, the experts say this will still take. It's a long, long way from uh, from animal models uh, to an approved vaccine. So it will certainly take several years before we might end there, and it might not work out at the end for influenza. For decades, people try to develop a vaccine which is sort of pen protective against all influenza viruses or at least influenza A. And it has not yet worked out. That's why we get vaccinated every fall, right? With a newly mixed uh, vaccine. Mm. So there is hope, but there is no guarantee and it will certainly not be available during the next two to three years. Okay, thanks a lot. And can I have one, one more quick question? Mm -hmm. Do you think that the all the knowledge that is now created through this uh, pandemic uh, and, and all the related um, scientific interest on, on the vaccines and so on, will this uh, influence also the creation of vaccines for the influenza stuff? So basically do, does the, the scientific uh, teams, do they learn from the pandemic? Uh, things that we can use in other areas as well? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so this is a, a fascinating period because as you know, like as everywhere, if you invest uh, significantly, you, you see an, a, a boost in, in speed of, uh, you know, development of, of new insights or products. And this has happened here for, uh, we, we could have been in a much better position if people would have invested or governments, societies, industries in vaccine development uh, before. But, you know, some people tried to advocate for that. Like Bill Gates, although he's an enemy, is seen as an enemy by many, but he tried to write, to make people alert of this need to invest in that in time has not been done. But now we have invested a lot and we have learned a lot. This was the breakthrough of this mRNA technology, which was available for many, many years already, but has never been significantly funded and uh, been, been, been used at that scale. And this will be used for certainly for other diseases and not only actually infectious diseases, but also for treatment of other diseases. So there are, this is the good side of this. this massive investment in, in, in research will pay off not only in the fight against SARS-CoV-2, but on, in, in many, many fields. So that's something positive we can take with us. But my concern is that we now, people think, oh, Omicron is mild, let's relax. And what, what do we do if the next variant is not mild? Um, you know, there is this, the main problem is, this is coming from something like Ebola. People, this, this perception viruses want to become milder. And the idea is, right, if you kill your host too fast, if the virus infects you and you die in 10 minutes, then the virus has no opportunity to spread. And yes, then there is a selective force that it becomes milder because if the host survives longer, it can spread better. And you can see this in, in but for SARS-CoV-2, people die after two or three weeks or five weeks or six weeks, and they are no longer infectious. 
So there is no selection for mild disease, right? Mm -hmm. Because you became severely ill when you're no longer infectious. And the, the virus has already spread during the first week when you're not severely ill. Mm -hmm. So this is a misconception that people think it will certainly become milder. This is goes actually in the wrong direction, basically. <laughs> exactly. So it, yeah. it can go in all directions now and we were lucky with omicron and maybe we remain lucky because there is not much space to explore for the virus anymore but it can also go the other way around okay thanks a lot some more questions my request for you would be to to support um uh, also that we have the testing, you know, there's a big discussion in Austria now, right, that uh, this testing for free should be stopped, it's a waste of money, blah, 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 but we need this test, we need to be able to, after Omicron in fall, when the next variant comes, to build up this testing capacity uh, fast, and in, in Vienna, you might know that about 1,500 people work for Alice Google, and if you just, you know, get rid of them now, you don't employ them anymore. So how do you find all these experts in fall in a very quick time period? And how do you make this testing available for the vulnerable who need, as I said, to know about their infection very fast to get treatment in time? So I think we discuss way too little about these challenges. We just say, oh, wow, this is expensive, no longer needed, we should get rid of it. But that's too simplistic. I think we need to think about how can we keep it on you sort of available on hold, right? And, and relaunch it fast if, if we need it and have a basic service available for the vulnerable throughout the year. And I, I hear too little discussion about this. It's always, it's black and white, right? Either we have it full scale or we shut it off. <laughs> and that's, that's not how it should be. Herr Luber. Yes, uh, well, I, from the audience, I think it's time uh, uh, for a, a, a simple person who is not an expert to thank you uh, dearly for this wonderful presentation. And it's, it's the most detailed uh, information that uh, I think is available. So therefore, my question, and I put it already in writing as a question, uh, whether your charts and, and the pictures uh, on the basis of which you made your presentation would be available to the participants uh, <clears throat> in the internet or uh, downloadable on the homepage of AmpJam or available by uh, by an email, uh, if we request one. Uh, of course, always uh, uh, emphasizing the author. No, thank you. Um, I'm happy to share the slides. The only thing is, I don't put it maybe uh, spread it too too much online because of one reason. When I assembled the talk yesterday evening, I put some pictures. I say this here, uh, just from I took some pictures just from the internet, right? Like the fortress and so on. Uh -huh. And this is always you can for internal talks you can do it, but that's yes. nothing you should do. You know, if you make it sort of wide available to to the wider public because then this fortress picture for example i don't have obviously it's not a picture i have taken but i just uh -huh. used it to, to illustrate it that's why i i'm happy to share it in, in this circle uh, but maybe it's ideal not to put it you know oh yes at, we will respect twitter <laughs> Yeah, maybe we'll maybe I can I can add some information concerning uh, this request. Uh, if you want to review our MCM talks and of course also this MCM talk, mm -hmm. you have the possibility to get the link on our homepage. So Very you can good. review it and 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 look at the slides uh, this way. If, okay, if perfect. That. From when? From when on? Uh, at two what days time? after. Yeah, I think Monday or Tuesday we have the link on on our homepage. Oh, great. Thank you. And you can review all the AmCham talks on our homepage. Okay. Müller has still a question. 
Yes. Uh, hello, thanks uh, first for this very interesting uh, uh, elaboration. Could you tell us a little bit more about long COVID and uh, how this plays with the different variants or is it completely uh, 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 different? Yeah, important question actually, also econo economically an important question, often overlooked. So um, yeah, as you know, long COVID, um, is when you have symptoms more than three or four months after the infection and the range of symptoms is from let's say mild symptoms to really severe so that people um, can no longer work and um, I know personally know someone so it's, it's quite impressive in a negative way right if uh, if you see that highly active people all of a sudden uh, even just going around the house is a challenge for them and the um, first of all, there are now emerging data that vaccination protects, not fully, but qu quite strongly against long COVID. So that's the good news. What's not known, what if you have many, many reinfections, right, breakthrough infections over your lifetime, does this then cumulatively increase again your risk for long COVID? This is something one of the big question marks and it's not the only long-term consequence you might know that you have a much higher risk if you do surgery after even a mild uh, omicron infection or other sars-cov-2 variant infection you have a much higher risk for, of complications and dying in any kind of surgery so they now recommend that you wait at least three months if you can right if it's an elective surgery um, to, uh, before you go to hospital after an infection. So there are several of these diabetes risk in kids. It seems to increase. Uh, there is this MESC, this multi-inflammatory disease, which comes a few weeks after the infection in some kids. So there are several long-term consequences which we have difficulties to uh, quantify and, and to evaluate the risk uh, for vaccinated people. So for Omicron, as these are long-term consequences. It's almost still too new to really study this, right? Will we see in three, four, five months many long COVID cases too early to, to, to make a judgment on, on this? I would rather be surprised. Yeah, I would more be surprised if it if it's, has a lower long COVID ratio, because even in mild um, infections with Delta or previous variants, the long COVID risk was there. So it would be surprising if it's not there for Omicron, but who knows? As we don't understand the mechanism for long COVID yet, it's hard to make predictions. Okay, okay. thank you. Lydia? Yeah, I just, I heard, heard from the US, uh, my sister's a microbiologist, and I'd heard that, um, that there was a study that showed that uh, people who had had a history of Epstein-Barr virus were the most likely to get long-term chronic fatigue syndrome as a long COVID reaction. Is that true? Well, I'm not sure whether it's true, but it's one of the hypotheses which is currently mm -hmm. explored. So the reactivation of the Epstein-Barr virus, which is a virus which we all have basically because you get it during your childhood. And actually it has some other ugly consequences, right? And at the very low percentage, you can develop cancer after infection with this virus years later. And there has been a shown now, it's quite interesting, a strong link between Epstein-Barr and multiple sclerosis. Sclerosis, yeah. And um, actually a nice illustration or an impressive illustration about possible long-term consequences of virus infections. And so one of the theories is that SARS-CoV-2 reactivates this latent mm -hmm. uh, Epstein-Barr virus infections. And this mm -hmm. is currently explored as a mechanism. Ex excellent point. Maybe you give me a second to, to emphasize this. I'm always surprised that the anti-vaxxers are concerned about long-term consequences of the vaccine. And no, no one is concerned about long-term consequences of the infection. And mm -hmm. we just discussed the Epstein-Barr virus, right? With cancer, with multiple sclerosis. So the risk, right. the long-term consequence from the virus is much <laughs> higher than from the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Some more questions? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I we have are one more. 
I have one. I have one more question, if we have the time, uh, yes. because you mentioned the anti-vaxxers and their fear of long-term uh, effects of the uh, vaccines, especially with uh, in in with regards to the mRNA, because they claim it's the first time we use this and it's new. And you mentioned it before, actually, that the this uh, vehicle of mRNA is. Uh, already available since years, but it was not widespread actually. Uh, do you have any any ideas or suggestions? I mean, I, I'm anyways not in a position to discuss this topic because I'm just not uh, not not good enough with my knowledge about it. But uh, uh, it's quite interesting because usually when I hear anti-vaxxers, uh, they do not have uh, any arguments uh, really. They just say, we don't know what could happen. And this is something you cannot um, eliminate well, because it, it's right. We don't know what could happen in 10 years. That's yeah, there are, but there are very easy arguments uh, you can, all of you can use. Uh, one is, you know, if you get an infection with SARS-CoV-2, a lot of messenger RNA of this virus will be in your cells, but not only in your arm muscle for a few days, but throughout your body, right? In your lungs, in other organs. So they are concerned about the messenger RNA from the vaccine, but they are not concerned by the natural messenger RNA from the virus, which will flood your body in much higher concentrations than after being vaccinated. Second, long-term effects from vaccines have not been described. So in, there are serious side effects of vaccines, also of this one. So you can get myocarditis, for example, uh, there are thrombosis events, but the percentage is very well described and is always lower than the percentage of the same disease from infection. So if you get infected as a young man by SARS-CoV-2, your risk for a myocarditis is higher than by the vaccine. So it's still worth getting the vaccine, although there are side effects, but these are not. There is no example in history from vaccination that a side effect would occur 10 years after a vaccination and would not have been known before. So the, the side effects, usually we learn about those earlier on if so many people get vaccinated. And we, there are some side effects, also serious side effects, but again, the risk of those very same effect, side effects from an infection is much higher than from uh, vaccination. But there are ample of examples where viruses have long-term diseases. We just talked about multiple sclerosis, but there are many others. Measles, you can die some years later by a brain um, disease. Um, you, you might know, what is it in English? The, um, Chicken pox, right? If you have a chicken pox uh, infection, you can, when you become elderly, it gets reactivated and you can really suffer from it. And there are so many examples. There is a polio, many had mild polio. We don't know this, polio was not always severe. There were also many mild cases, but there is something which is called late polio. So after 10 to 20 years, you can develop severe symptoms. And no one knows what will there be a late SARS-CoV-2 other than you know, the, the, the things we have already discussed. So the risk of the virus is much higher than a, a hypothetical risk of mRNA vaccines. And yes, the technology is new, but if you get infected, you get always infected with mRNA. So whether you get it injected by the virus or by a syringe should not change the risk, right? <laughs> Okay, thanks a lot. Yes, yeah, so thank you very much, Professor Wagner, for your highly interesting insights. Excellent keynote, excellent presentation. Thank you very, very much for being our guest. My pleasure. And thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Have a so nice day. Interesting. And we, we see this as a vivid uh, Q&A interest. So, and thank you all for joining us. I wish you a great Friday. Have a wonderful weekend. And I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much.